Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Timothy Connor, and I am a student pastor here at St. Giles Kingsway. Let us read from Psalm 111, a psalm of praise. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who reverently fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, today we are celebrating Holy Communion. Those who have put their faith in Jesus as Savior are welcome to come forward at the appropriate time and join us in this sacred and hope-filled celebration. You may have noticed the candles here at the front of the sanctuary. Uh, Wednesday marked the beginning of Lent, and each week we will be extinguishing one candle progressively growing in darkness towards uh, Good Friday. We also have a Lenten drive where all the proceeds will be going to Neighbors in Need, uh, our Young Street mission. So you can pick up one of these containers at the front after service if you would like. Income tax receipts are in the cloak room for those who wish to pick them up as well. This Wednesday at 1.30 is our monthly prime time event. Uh, Don and Mary Lou have kindly asked me to be the guest speaker. So if you have absolutely nothing else to do that day, <laughs> I will be here. And you can learn more about me and my ups and downs with, uh, with uh, my walk with God. So we'd love to see you there. There will also be a faith sharing group Thursday at 1.30, where we will be discussing chapter 21 of the story. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, as many of you know, and on this day, we use a call to worship from Presbyterian World Service and Development. If you're willing and able, you may now stand for this worship call and recite the words that are bolded on the screen. On this first Sunday of Lent, we find Jesus in the wilderness facing temptation. And 40 days in the wilderness is a long time. We too experience wilderness times of temptation, challenge and change. Yet even in the wilderness and among the wild beasts, the angels cared for Jesus. As we make our way in the wilderness, we hear the good news that we are not alone. The reign of God has come near in Christ. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 277, Holy, Holy, Holy.
In the season of Advent, we see the candles over on this side of the sanctuary in that wreath. And I was explaining to our, our after-school program children on Thursday that in Advent, you see a growing brightening toward Christmas. Week by week, a candle is lit. And then finally, on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, the Christ candle is lit. And as Timothy was explaining today, the, the idea of the candles here, and this isn't something done, I don't think, in too many churches, but the idea of extinguishing one candle a week in the season of Lent is a reminder of Jesus as he walked to the cross. And so that growing darkness until finally, and I, I hope many of you can attend that important service on Good Friday when we read that Jesus breathed his last, the Christ candle is extinguished. And that helps us anticipate, look forward to the celebration of Easter, Christ's resurrection. So join with me in this season of Lent as, as we come before our holy God, as we lift our hearts up in prayer. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with your glory. Oh God, we are so pleased to be able to come, to have the freedom and health and strength to come and gather in this place, this sanctuary set aside for a peculiar purpose that the people of God and, and people who are longing and thirsting and yearning for an encounter with you, God, might come and gather and be blessed and equipped, challenged, rebuked, encouraged, built up in the faith. And so we come as your people, not because we are particularly more holy than those of our neighbors we live around, but because we recognize our need for grace. Almighty God, you are good, and we do worship you, and as we do so, we see, we can't help but see our, our own sinful nature. In the light of your glory, we see the darkness of fear and anxiety and anger and lust in our own hearts, our own minds, and we're, we're baffled by it. We've confessed it before. We've tried to change our ways, but we keep turning back. The very things I do not want to do, this I keep doing, yells out the Apostle Paul. From ancient times, Lord, humans have fumbled. They, they want to do what is right. When they encounter you, God, when they meet your grace in Jesus Christ, they want to live in a way that pleases you, yet they continually fail. And though in the grand scheme of the world we might think our failures don't make a big difference. We know that the very envy and anger and lust is what drives nations against nations and causes hatred and genocide. So we come. We come particularly in the season of Lent, ready to repent of our sin and our failing, to humble ourselves and pray. And so we pray. As Jesus, the chief shepherd, taught us to, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, the scriptures tell us that if we're willing to confess and to admit our failing and sin, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, receive the good news of the gospel. As you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
join me. Come join me, any of the kids that are here today. I have a problem. The mic I had, didn't, the battery it wasn't turning on, so I'm going to try to project my voice. Use my teacher voice. Can you hear me? Come have a seat here, guys. My friends. John, can you see from there? Come on up. I have brought, actually, I'm going to sit down. I have brought my calendar. And as you can see, something happened this past Wednesday. What was this past Wednesday? Heidi? Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. And that meant it was the beginning of a new season in the church the new season of Lent. We know that, right? Well, sometimes, whoops, I could have sit down. It's a little easy, easier for me. Um, with Lent, what are, we, what are we thinking about? What's special about Lent? We're preparing for Jesus coming to Jerusalem and dying for our sins, right? Which is really a pretty special thing. Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, Jesus dying for our sins, yeah, okay. Jesus dying on the cross, yeah. But does it feel really anything? We hear it so often, don't we? That it doesn't really have that feeling. Well, I was watching one of my favorite princess movies called Beauty and the Beast. Thumbs up if you know it. You know it. Beauty's father gets put into the prison of the castle. Why? Because he trespasses and he takes a rose. So the beast locks him up. And Beauty runs into the castle wondering where her father is. Is that true? Do you remember that? Well, this movie reminds me, this spot reminds me of what Jesus did, kind of, for us. Can we play it at the two-minute mark? Celine, what are you doing here? Where's, where's Papa? Where is he, Philippe? Two-minute mark? You have to find him. You have to take me if to If that's him. possible. There's the castle. And beauty comes on her horse. She's led up into the castle, and there. Is anyone here? Papa. She finds her father. We got volume. How did you find me? Oh, your hands are like ice. <laughs> I have to get you out of there. No, I want you to leave this. Place. So, Who's done this to you? the no time beauty asks how her father now. is, and he says, "Oh, I'm okay." And she feels him and says, "You're so cold." And he coughs. You must be sick. And. There the Please beast comes, and the beast, have he says, what are you doing in my castle? Please, I'll do anything. And she says, you've got to let my father go. He's sick. Please, please let him go. And he says, he stole a rose. He has to stay here. And Beauty decides, right there, take me instead. Let my father go. I will stay in the castle for the rest of my life, but let my father go. And when I saw that, I don't know about you guys, but I, I started to cry. Oh my goodness, that was it. That was it. He, she was going to let her father go, give his life, she was gonna give her life for her father and leave no more enjoyment. She would spend the rest of her life in that prison. Wow. Did it make, did it make you cry when you saw that? It did. It was terrible. It reminds me of what Jesus did for us. He gave his life for us. But we know when he gave his life, he didn't stay dead. He rose again. So Lent is about thinking about all that Christ did for us. Today you're going to learn about Esther. And she 
did the same sort of thing. All right, you get to go with Beth today. Yay! Before we read from the scripture, let us pray. Prepare our hearts and minds, O God, to receive your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may obey your will through Jesus Christ. Amen. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's law. It is not in the best it is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took a signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was, a, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of a sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her, and he told him how to and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold, the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the, their king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the word of the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we, we look for your Holy Spirit of inspiration. We want to, as that hymn calls us to, to take time to be holy. It's hard for us to know how to do that. Can we make ourselves holy? We ought to, in this season in particular, take time to abide in your word, God. To welcome your Holy Spirit as we meditate on the scriptures so that it's not just an academic exercise or an empty ritual that we have to read the Bible today. I'm going to get that done so I can get on to other things. May it be a spiritual and life-giving discipline to us. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us in your word this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in uh, grade seven or grade eight, I had a very good friend, uh, Andrew Pendakis. I still have that very good friend. We had breakfast over Christmas time. He was actually the best man at my wedding. I met him when we were six years old, and his backyard was just a little bit over from my backyard. So we often jump over each other's fences and spend time together. We were adventurers in a very little a adventurous way. We, we were pretty timid boys, I would say, on the most part. We got into some mischief, but uh, we didn't like the people we were around in school. There was a growing awareness in, in later elementary school that, yeah, we, we didn't really fit in. And we might have thought, well, we're both Christians. Maybe they're being mean to us because we're Christians, but I don't think that's it. I think we've just had a hard time fitting in. Our moms, like many moms throughout history, I'm sure, were protective of us and, and decided our, these, these little boys should go to a Christian high school. And at that point in grade eight, Andrew and I were ready to try anything, just get away from the group we were around. So we went to Eden, what a great name, right? <laughs> this oasis, Eden Christian College in Niagara-on-the-Lake area. And so our moms sacrificed a lot to get us to that high school, with lots of uh, drives and pickups to the bus and, and busing back and forth. But as much as I think Andrew and I enjoyed that little oasis away, we knew, and our moms knew, one day you've got to go back into the real world. I think a lot of us as Christians maybe think that way. We get fearful, anxious, angry at what's going on in the world, and we want to retreat and in some way escape from it and, and not be tainted by the, the sin of the world and come to the sanctuary of like-minded believers and, and leave the world out there. I think the book of Esther is one that doesn't encourage that. It's interesting that nowhere in this short book of the Bible does it say that the, the Jewish people were, were longing to get home. Oh, that we could get to Jerusalem. Oh, that we could get to the sacred city, to our homeland. Everything would be better. No, there was a pursuit of how do we be faithful? How do we live for God and our fellow people here in a foreign land? How do we be faithful in the foreign land? And I think, I'm, I'm not going to blame my mom or Andrew's mom for misguiding, misdirecting us, but I think it's better for Christians to, to work on being equipped and ready to face the world from a young age and learn how to be Christians in the foreign land, in Babylon, in Persia. Esther is a strange book of the Bible. I must admit, I've never, never, 20 years and maybe more in seminary, never preached on it, never done a Bible study on it, 
I'm sort of of that strict reformed heritage where I don't see God's name in this book. I'm not going to preach on it. Isn't that fascinating? I don't know if you noticed that. If you read through the book, God isn't mentioned. Faith isn't mentioned in the book of Esther. A lot of reformers, I think Martin Luther included, there might have been other Jewish baggage with Martin Luther, we know that. But he wanted to pull Esther out of the canon of Holy Scripture. Even its very placement, the way the Old Testament is organized for us, the Hebrew Bible and in the Christian Bible, or how it's placed together is there's sections, the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books, and, and then you have uh, all the historical books like the Kings and Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you have the writings, sort of prose, like the book of Job isn't pretending to be a, a historical book, but a writing. Uh, a prose about this man and what happens when you lose everything how do you be faithful to God then Esther's on the border isn't she that book leans up against the historical accounts of Ezra and Nehemiah and against the writings of the Psalms and the Proverbs and Song of Songs and, and these books Esther is a strange book in the Bible you get the feeling that Shakespeare really loved the book of Esther with all the intrigue and all these plots and the amazing, surprising changes that come that we don't expect. We don't even know who wrote the book of Esther or exactly where it fits in history. We can't find that in other records. But here, with all my kind of complaining, it's in the Bible. And so what can we, as Christians, learn from it. I hope many of you read the book and like you've read a lot of the Old Testament in these 20 chapters of the story, we have one more week in the Old Testament until we're finally into the, the New Testament. That's right, two weeks from now we celebrate Christmas, <laughs> strangely, in the season of Lent. We'll, we'll kind of enter into the story of Jesus two Sundays uh, from, from now. But Esther's there in the Old Testament, and, and like some of those other Old Testament books, I've heard from a lot of those reading the story, why is there so much blood and warfare? It gets there, doesn't that? In this book, the Jews, yes, are unfairly um, attacked. There's, a, there's an edict to annihilate, wipe out the Jews, but then there's this inordinate retaliation. The people all throughout the Persian Empire are slaughtered. It's very hard for us to read that and to think about what's going on today and grapple with the issues of what is just war? What is fair retaliation? These are issues that we carry into the reading of a book like Esther. The celebration for the Jewish people, Purim, came out of the book of Esther, this celebration that still goes on today, uh, March 23rd, 24th, is when Purim will be celebrated by the Jewish people. For most people, it's just a drinking party. It's a big, big celebration, drinking and partying. Um, but the origins are that day that the Jews got to retaliate against their enemies. Thankfully, most don't mention that or celebrate that today, but it's complicated isn't it? I asked Kaya to read just a section of Esther, that central section, and I, and I think in that section we can gain some application for what it means to be a faithful follower of God. We've done some of the background before, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that too much, but basically the short background is Xerxes, very powerful king of Persia, huge empire, um, and the important thing to notice in this book is that not all the Jewish people went back. We talked about last week that many went back to Jerusalem, to Judah, and began to rebuild the temple. We'll talk about that next week in Nehemiah. But in Esther, the focus is there's many Jewish people that stayed in the diaspora, that stayed sprinkled throughout the provinces of Persia, and right there in the city as well. Mordecai the Jew is there, he has a prominent position, and he has a much younger cousin, Hadassah, later named Esther, who is beautiful. 
The king is very displeased with his wife. I won't get into the details and gets rid of her and then has a beauty pageant. It says, collect all the beautiful young virgins throughout my empire, bring in the best ones, uh, give them beauty treatments for a year. Each of them has one night with me. Yes, this is in the Bible. <laughs> uh, Esther won that beauty pageant in that one night with the king and she becomes queen, Queen Esther. In the text we read today, we come in at this place where this man, Haman, is very angry at the Jewish people, at Mordecai in particular. Mordecai won't bend the knee to Haman, a very powerful figure in the empire, because Mordecai, as a Jewish man, doesn't bow the knee to anyone but God alone. And Haman thinks it's too little a thing just to have Mordecai killed, he thinks all the Jewish race should be annihilated. And amazing, the king doesn't ask questions when we read the account. He just takes Haman at his word and, oh, there's a troublesome people, you say? Sure, here's my ring. Send out the edict to people of all provinces on this one day you're allowed to slaughter any of your Jewish neighbors and take their, their land, their belongings. Haman gives a donation to the king, and that money is used to send out the, uh, the messengers throughout the kingdom. And the king and Haman sit down and drink. That's how chapter 13 ends, and we read the words, and Susa, the city, was bewildered, baffled. Why? Why is this happening? The king said it is so. Mordecai the Jew then in the scene in chapter 4 is there on the ground with his fellow Jews. He's wearing a rough kind of sack that would carry hay and grain, a, a sackcloth. It's sort of like a, a penance that some, some people do, punishing themselves, humbling themselves, repenting, seeking God's favor. Mordecai is torn up for his people are going to be exterminated. He's wailing, he has ashes on his head, and Esther, his now royal cousin, hears about this. And Esther asks through a messenger to, to Mordecai what's going on, and she learns of what's happening, and Mordecai says, you've got to go and approach the king. You've got to ask for deliverance for the Jewish people. Esther's been royal for some time, and she kind of thinks, you don't understand. If I approach the king, without him beckoning me. It's death for me um, unless he extends the scepter. I could die. It's a normal human reaction, I'm sure. But Mordecai doesn't let her off that easily. Her older cousin says, if, if you don't stand up for us, deliverance for the Jews will come from somewhere else. He believes God is good. We are God's people. Deliverance will come. But, Queen Esther, perhaps this is the very reason you've come to this position for such a time as this. The queen's heart is changed. We know the story. She approaches the king after all the Jews and Susa are fasting and we understand praying. It doesn't even use that word praying here in this book, but we assume they're all praying for her. And she approaches the king, and he extends the scepter, and deliverance comes for the Jewish people. So, this story, this account of Esther, why here in the canon of Holy Scripture, what do we, what do we take from it? I think... There can be three lessons. Often preachers say that, right? Here's three points, three things I, I think we can draw from the story of Esther. The call, and especially in the season of Lent, the call to fast and pray when we are troubled. When we're greatly concerned about what's going on in our home nation, perhaps. When we're greatly troubled by, by some medical pronouncement that has you greatly worried about a loved one or even yourself. And we're troubled when we're afraid, we're called to fast, to pray, to look to God for help in our time of need. And not just to deliver 
us. That's a teaching in the book of Esther, but concentrate on what God's will is, not our own will. I like that uh, hymn we sang, Take Time to Be Holy. And in the second verse, it, it says, Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be, thy friends and thy conduct, his likeness shall see. We take time to be holy, fasting and praying in this time of Lent when we're concerned of global anxiety. We seek peace for the world. We pray. We fast, and as our stomachs grumble, maybe just for that one day of fasting, then we're reminded of those in the world who have nothing to eat every day. We're humbled, and we're grateful, and we pray. Secondly, something that shines through the, the book of Esther, if we read it from the front end to the back, is the sovereignty of God. God's involved. We might be a little troubled by the morality of it all and this Jewess who sleeps with the king and then wins the beauty pageant. We might not like aspects or the Purim celebration at the end, but as Christians looking back, putting on our, our Christian glasses, what we see shining forth is the sovereign hand of God. God is in control. God has a plan. Even that night of insomnia for King Xerxes, he can't sleep and he asks that some records be given to him to read like for Presbyterians the Book of Forms. You're sure to fall asleep if you start reading the Book of Order, right, for, for our churches. You know. uh, he gets those annals and they begin to read it and then he hears something interesting that Mordecai had uncovered a plot to kill the king. And he says, well, what was done for that man? Nothing, my lord, he's never been rewarded. Something should be done. Hammond's the next person who walks into the court, and he's like, you, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Haman thinks it's for himself, and he says, oh, you should have a royal horse and vestments from the king and parade him through the town saying, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And he says, great, do that for Mordecai. Haman has to do that for his arch enemy, arch enemy. God's sovereign hand. Haman's plot is uncovered through Esther, revealing through the, the dinner. And Haman is the one who suffers, and the Jews are set free. Number one, the call to fast and pray. Number two, we see the sovereignty of God on display. Number three, and I think most importantly, the willingness to lose power to save people. The willingness to lose power, to humble oneself, to serve and save others, to honor God. Esther was in a very comfortable position. Mordecai had said to her, don't let the king know your ethnicity. No one knew. Seems like she didn't have parents or siblings. Her old uncle was the only one really, she was connected to. She had a beautiful life of comfort, we assume, in the palace. She didn't have to do anything. She was willing to come down from the palace and become one of them, this despised people, the Jews. Timothy Keller made much of, of this teaching. He even goes so far as to say Esther is like a prefigurement of Christ, that, that Esther is a type of Christ, looking forward to Christ, who also came down from the palace to become one of us, humble himself. Paul's letter to the Philippians in chapter 2. We read these words. Your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, 
who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Friends, it's a challenging book of the Bible to reflect upon, but may God help us to learn these lessons, the practice of fasting and praying for others, the awareness of the sovereign hand of God in our lives, and the call to be willing to humble ourselves to serve others, as Christ did most profoundly, most perfectly for us. Thanks be to God. Friends, please note as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, any who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord are welcome to come to the table to receive with gratitude and, and hearts of joy. Also notice that we will pass out the bread. Everyone can partake and at the same time, so hang on to the bread and then to the cup, and we'll all take at the same moment as an expression of our unity together. Please be seated. We read today the call for us to humble ourselves, to repent and pursue the love of God and the love of all people. 
We're challenged in Lent to reflect Jesus Christ to the world around us. We're reminded of our deep gratitude for what Jesus has done for all of us. We gather to give thanks for what he accomplished through his suffering on the cross. After living a sinless life, he took on the sins of the whole world and experienced the wrath of God to the full measure for our salvation. Forgiveness of sins, mercy and grace, eternal life has been granted by Christ through his death and sacrifice on the cross. And we celebrate that truth today. Let us take a moment to repent of our sins in the quiet time before the Lord. Let us stand together and we will affirm our faith according to the Apostles' Creed. It is in the hymnal, number 616. I believe it will also be put on the screen. Let us stand together as we profess our faith. Number 616. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we take the bread and the cup, we stand in awe that we are able to commune with the living God. In this sacrament, rightly celebrated in unified worship, God's Holy Spirit enters in, transforming us, sanctifying us for his glory in the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom. And so with hearts laden with wonder, gratitude, and joy, we pray. Please be seated. You may be seated. How joyful we are, loving God. Never has such an act of love been accomplished before or since the sacrifice of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, mighty one, for sending Jesus into this broken world, for permitting such sacrifice in your pursuit of us. As we enter this season of Lent, we seek to remember your walk, Lord Jesus, to the cross. We recall with a mix of joy and sadness your suffering and death. We know you conquered death, the tomb is empty. You have risen and ascended, and you are Lord of all. O Lord Christ, through your humble obedience, your sacrifice was enough for everyone forever. So today we partake rejoicing in his triumph over death, over the tomb, over the evil that so easily entangles us. We gather around the Lord's table rejoicing in the presence of the Spirit moving among us today. Any good thing, any love, compassion, unity, and right worship we're able to muster is due to your Holy Spirit transforming work among us, enabling us to think less of ourselves and more of others, equipping us to love you, our Creator, our Lord, our Guide, with all we are. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now and these elements set apart for, from common use, that we may be together unified with Christ who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forevermore. Amen. Friends, know that our Savior invite those who love him, who have received him and believe in his power to set us right before a holy God to come to the table to receive in remembrance 
but also with joy. Because we feed on Jesus, the living bread, we who are many form one body, for we all partake in him. When we break the bread, it is a sharing in the body of Christ. Friends, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus said, this is my body given for you. Eat of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. <coughs> Friends, together we partake in the blood of the new covenant the covenant of grace through Christ. When we bless the cup, it is a sharing in the blood of Christ poured out for the forgiveness of sins.
after Jesus and his disciples had finished eating, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Drink from it, all of you in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Eternal God, this is indeed a holy mystery. You give yourself to us as we eat and drink in faith. Help us to live up to and into this high and holy calling. We have taken on the new self. Enable us to not just believe, but in strength and courage, based on your word, help us share our faith joyfully and lovingly with others. In this season of Lent, we are reminded of Jesus' persistence to stay true to his calling despite the cost. We thank you for the opportunity we are granted to serve you and to be a blessing in the lives of those less fortunate here and abroad. Give us generous hearts as we prayerfully support the Lenten mission of supporting Young Street Mission. We pray today for those of our church who are unable to fully celebrate due to surgery, sickness, or inability to leave their homes and care centers. We pray for the oppressed, the afraid, the alone, the suffering in the world. We think of those in the unstable nation of Ukraine. We think of those in the Middle East. We pray for an end to this brutal war that wages on in Israel, Palestine. We pray for just leadership to arise and for the care of the weak and poor who are trampled upon. Gracious Father, grant them strength and courage and a sense of your love and presence, we pray. Father, in this thoughtful season of Lent, may we often think of the love you came to offer and give thanks. May we not simply retreat from the world, pointing out the evil at work and wash our hands of it, but be ambassadors of your love and truth in our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces. <coughs> Almighty God, grant that we may go into the world renewed by your strength, grace, and love. For these are the prayers of your people, and we pray them in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Friends, may we go forth from this place a people of faith, of great faith, believing God is alive, God is at work. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you this Lenten season and forevermore. Amen.